Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Libyan regime blasts NATO over massacre of 85 villagers. Saudi Arabia renews mediation efforts to end Yemeni crisis. And Syria continues pursuing terrorist groups as Turkey urges an end to violence. Mosaic, world news from the Middle East begins now. Knowledgeable sources said Yemeni opposition representatives, the joint meeting parties, and the al Amar clan are currently in the city of Jeddah to find a way to end the political crisis sweeping Yemen. On the other hand, an official Saudi source said the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia offered a new proposal that would transfer the authorities of Yemeni President Ali Abdullah Saleh to his deputy in exchange for commitments by the joint meeting parties and the opposition. The political crisis sweeping Yemen for almost six months is once again in the spotlight. The country's cities and towns have turned into squares, witnessing massive popular demonstrations to demand an end to the rule of President Ali Abdullah Saleh, who has been holding on to power for over 33 years. The protests turned into daily events, reaching their peak on Fridays. The youth of the revolution are supported by a wide range of the Yemeni society, including army units and a number of high-ranking officers. However, the demonstrator's goal has still not been accomplished. Even when President Saleh was being treated in Riyadh for injuries sustained during an assassination attempt at the beginning of June, he continued to impede a solution to the crisis. He has not displayed any readiness to relinquish power, and his two-month-long absence has added additional doubt and instability in Yemen. Regional and international powers have attempted to convince him to change his position and, according to a media source, American officials have managed to convince him not to return to Yemen. However, Yemeni officials have denied the claim, saying he will return to Sana'a. Sana'a and other Yemeni cities have been witnessing an increasing number of clashes between pro saleh Republican Guard forces and armed tribal groups who support the opposition. But on the horizon, there are new attempts and efforts to put an end to the crisis, and they are essentially based on amending the Gulf Initiative, which would be its sixth amendment. The initiative calls on Saleh to resign one month after the opposition forms a national unity government, to be followed by presidential elections within 60 days. Knowledgeable sources say the visit of Abdul Karim al riani the Yemeni president's advisor to Riyadh, tackled a new plan that includes additional amendments to the initiative. Saudi Arabia suggested that Saleh transfer his authorities to his deputy in exchange for commitments by the joint meeting parties and the opposition that Saleh would become the honorary president of Yemen and Saudi Arabia until the end of the year when presidential elections are held. At the same time, the city of Jeddah is hosting Yemeni opposition representatives from the joint meeting parties and the al Ahmar clan. They are looking into finding a way out of the crisis, a crisis during which President Saleh reneged three times on the deal despite having accepted it. The Libyan regime announced that NATO killed 85 people in the village of Al Majar, south of Zlitan. Libyan government spokesman Musa Ibrahim said 33 of the victims were children, 32 were women, and 20 were men. Ibrahim added that the first airstrike targeted the village and killed a number of citizens, while the second strike killed people who rushed to rescue the victims of the first strike. As for the revolutionaries, they have been trying for a week to seize the city of Zlitan, located east of Tripoli. 
In another development, Libyan opposition leader Mustafa Abdul Jalil dismissed the executive board of the Transitional National Council and appointed Mahmoud Jibril to form a new board. Reliable sources said the move was taken following escalating disputes between the liberal and Islamic wings within the opposition in general and specifically within the council. The assassination of the Libyan opposition's military leader, Abdul Fattah Yunus, several days ago, dealt a strong blow to the revolutionaries, and it seems it has forced them to recalculate and reorganize their internal structure. The first new arrangements were made by Transitional National Council Chairman Mustafa Abdul Jalil, who announced the executive board will be dismantled and its work suspended. Media sources confirmed the head of the board, Mahmoud Jibril, was appointed again to form a new executive board. The move was taken due to some members' lack of competence in dealing with the military commander's assassination, especially since the case remains ambiguous. On the ground, fierce seesaw battles are still ongoing between the revolutionaries and Qaddafi's battalions. The Libyan revolutionaries said they consolidated their strongholds in the town of Bir al Ghanim, which they claimed control over two days ago. They denied Tripoli's assertion that its forces recaptured the town from the revolutionaries. The February 17th revolutionaries approached from Azawiya and reached Bir al Ghanim. It's certain that they have regrouped their units by now. The current important mission is to enter into a new round of battles with the tyrant's battalions. While France announced its decision to recall the nuclear powered aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle from the Libyan waters after it took part in the military campaign on Libya, UNESCO Director General Irina Bokova strongly condemned NATO's airstrikes on Tripoli, which killed dozens of citizens. In another development, President of Chad, Idris Deby, called for dialogue and an end to the fighting. He believes the war on Libya has reached a dead end, and the time has come for the African Union and the international community to sit at the dialogue table in order to restore peace in Libya. As the massacre continues in Syria, Arab and international powers escalated their positions as President Bashar al-Assad received a firm letter from the Turkish leadership. The letter was delivered by Turkish Foreign Minister Ahmed Davutoglu during his one-day visit to Damascus that lacked the customary warm welcoming. During the meeting that lasted many hours, signs of uneasiness were apparent on the faces of the Syrian president, his foreign minister and media advisor. According to the Syrian state news agency, Assad confirmed to Tavatoglu that he will not be tolerant in pursuing what he referred to as armed terrorist groups. Egyptian Foreign Minister Mohamed Kamal Ahmed confirmed that his country is following with great concern the dangerous deterioration of the situation in Syria. He expressed fear that the situation in Syria is headed toward a point of no return. He stressed on the importance of acting quickly to salvage the situation. Ahmed reiterated the statement he issued at the beginning of Ramadan of the necessity to conduct reforms in Syria on the national level in order to avoid the risk of internationalizing the crisis, something the region would not be able to handle. He affirmed that blood-soaked reforms are useless. Twenty-two Syrian civilians were killed and dozens were wounded by the gunfire of Syrian security forces in Deir Azur, Hamas countryside and Idlib. The areas are witnessing military operations in which tanks are participating. This is a glimpse into leaked scenes displaying what Syrian cities and towns are being subjected to at the hands of those referred to as the protectors of the homeland, in reference to the Syrian Arab army backed by the Shabia. No Arab condemnation or international pressure managed to put an end to the bloody attacks and massacres committed by the Syrian regime in its attempt to repress the ever-expanding protests. The regime claimed that security forces began withdrawing from central Syria's Hama one week after storming the city and committing a number of massacres in its neighborhoods. However, the reality on the ground appears to contradict the official story. The opposition's website said tanks stormed a number of areas in Hama on Tuesday at dawn, especially the towns of Harfaya, Tibet Aliman, and Suran. It is reported that about 30 people were killed, including five children from the same family, and dozens were wounded.
While Syrian security forces continue their operations in the province of Homs, it was reported that the town of Al Giza in Horan is witnessing broad raids and an arrest campaign. Meanwhile, tanks stormed a number of cities in Idlib province and snipers were stationed on the buildings in Marat al Naman. In Benish, near the Turkish border, the situation on the ground was described as critical after a number of people were killed and injured while mosques sent out calls to rescue the wounded. Heavy gunfire was also reported in Latakia, especially in Sleiba and Al Akrafia. <laughs> As additional evidence of the policy of intimidation adopted by the regime against its people is a video circulating on the opposition's social networking sites. It shows the extent of the damage perpetrated by Syrian security to some houses in Hama, and on the walls apostatical statements were written equating Assad to God. Every night after the Tarawiyah and dawn prayers, the streets of Syrian cities and towns are filled with massive anti-regime demonstrations. The demand to lift the siege on besieged cities is renewed, as well as the demand for President al-Assad to relinquish power. Syrian protesters did not forget to salute and thank the Arab countries that recalled their ambassadors from Damascus in protest to the bloody repression the regime is using against its citizens. Despite the many articles prohibiting intervention in the internal affairs of sovereign nations, certain countries continue to meddle in Syrian affairs, not out of concern for Syria's security and stability, but out of concern for their own interests and special agendas. All of the measures, methods and languages that were used by certain countries against Syria are in blatant violation of international laws and principles as mandated by the UN Charter on Foreign Interventions. The UN Charter has specifically stated that nothing contained in the present Charter shall authorize the UN to intervene in matters which are essentially within the domestic jurisdiction of any state. According to the 1981 UN Charter on the Inadmissibility of Intervention, no state has the right to intervene directly or indirectly for any reason in the internal and external affairs of other states. States must refrain from the threats of using force, armed intervention, political disruption and military occupation. The vast majority of countries suddenly showing this special interest in the welfare of Syria and its people have violated such principles. These countries have taken unilateral measures targeting Syria's sovereignty, security and development. Foreign intervention in the internal affairs of sovereign states violates international laws. It's prohibited for anyone to intervene in the internal affairs of any state. We, as Syrians, will not allow any foreign European, Arab or Gulf Cooperation Council or Turkey to intervene in Syria's affairs. Syria is a sovereign nation. Now, anti-regime protesters have once again flooded the streets of Bahrain despite a heavy-handed security response. Demonstrations took place in the capital, Manama, and several villages, including Sitra, Karzakhan, and Ali. The protesters chanted slogans against King Hamad and demanded an end to his dictatorship. In Ali, Saudi-backed Bahraini troops used tear gas against the protesters. One protester's home was also set on fire. The Persian Gulf Sheikhdom has been rocked by a wave of anti-government protests since February. Dozens have been killed and hundreds wounded in the clampdown. Well, Gazans still suffer from continued power outages in the coastal strip. The Israeli siege of the territory has made fasting in this Ramadan a challenge for the residents of Gaza. Ashraf Shannon reports. 
Under Israeli blockade for over five years, Gaza's electrical crisis continues unabated. As a result, Gaza experiences outages of up to 12 hours a day, severely disrupting normal functioning of humanitarian infrastructure. The situation is especially hard during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan. Most Gazans are forced to have their iftar meals at dark, with many unable to even cook a meal due to power outages. According to the Palestinian non-governmental organization network Pingo, it is incumbent on Israel as the occupying power to provide for the needs of the people, including adequate power, what it has not done in 44 years. Israel continues to evade its responsibilities towards the civilian population as an occupying power under international humanitarian law. Gaza's power supply comes from three sources. It receives 17 megawatts from Egypt, 108 megawatts from Israel, and 55 megawatts generated by its own power plant. This amounts to 180 megawatts, or 75 percent, of its estimated demand of 240 megawatts. Our main problem in Gaza is the Israeli occupation. They control everything around us, and electricity shortage is a direct result of Israeli control. Power cuts place immense pressure on Gaza's crumbling electrical grid, adding misery to the lives of civilians, as Gazans will continue to bear the brunt of the reduction of power. It's very hard for us to deal with noisy small electrical generators day and night. Israel argues it's no longer bound by international law governing the administration of occupied territory to supply utilities to the civilian population. But the position accepted by the international community is that Israel remains legally responsible for the blockaded coastal enclave, despite withdrawing six years ago, because it still controls Gaza's borders, airspace and territorial waters. For five years now, Gazans have dealt with long hours of power outages during the month of Ramadan, usually eating the two meals, one at dusk and another at dawn, in the dark. Rights groups call on the international community to pressure Israel into lifting the Gaza siege as it violates international laws. Ashraf Shannon, Press TV Gaza. The occupation soldiers once again violated the blue line at the technical fence and withdrawal line near a Sama'a outpost on the outskirts of Farshuva. In response, the Lebanese army is taking necessary field measures in coordination with UNIFIL. The hills of Kfar Shuba are the new target of Israel's violation of UN Resolution 1701. These violations have been ongoing for 10 days. A 12-member Israeli patrol unit crossed on foot what is known as the withdrawal line and was reinforced by mechanized forces that remained inside the occupied territories. As a result, army units in the region and international forces were mobilized. A statement issued by the Lebanese Army's Guidance Directorate indicated the violation began at 10.30 a.m. and lasted about half an hour. During that time, enemy forces crossed the technical fence near Asamaka outpost and advanced 200 meters. The Jews set up an ambush from Asamaka outpost. Twelve of them came down. Two hid under the line and the other ten hid somewhere else. We took the goats and fled. We called the shepherd, put away the goats and came from the other side. It's either water or land. How is this possible? How can Israel breach the border every day from a different side? We hope that the Lebanese authorities, the international forces, and the international community take action. How often is there a breach of the border here? Every day. Last week they came down from this outpost three times. Today they came down from another outpost. Any gunfire? No, no gunfire. We didn't see anything, but we heard vehicles from this outpost and a lot of movement. We hear their vehicles circling around, but they usually stay behind the line and we don't see anything. But yesterday there was a lot of movement here and gunfire towards Sheba farms from the other side. On the outpost on top of Sheba, there were artillery and heavy machine guns. Sometimes at night, vehicles come up to Ruaisa El Sina and Ruaisa El Ranfa. We see their lights as they're going to outposts above. 
During our tour of the region that extends from Kfar Shuba to Berkat Batail, there was clear deployment of international forces and the Lebanese army. Together they were patrolling the border, including some stable locations. At the same time, the violation in Kfar Shuba was recorded, an Israeli force consisting of about six soldiers entered the Karum al Sharika region in Mesal Jabal. The unit crossed the technical fence without breaching the blue line. It stayed there for about 10 minutes. Such violations were repeated in the last few days. Israeli reports indicate that changes in the Arab world will force Tel Aviv to change its foreign and security policies. If these statements are combined with the semi-daily violations in the south and the reports that indicate there is no exit to the Israeli economic and social crisis, except if a change in its priorities is implemented, this could mean war. From the hills of Kfar Shuba, Basil al Aridi, New TV. Home, the Trachtenberg Committee, appointed by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, today met for the first time, charged with finding solutions to the burning social issues by restructuring budgetary priorities. At the start of the opening session, head of the commission, Professor Manuel Trachtenberg, said that the wave of social unrest is justified and that the test will be for the commission to collectively develop legitimate remedies. This after protest leaders yesterday issued a statement detailing their central commands. More in this report from IBA's Ariel Reshef. The ministerial team tasked with implementing economic and social reforms met today for the first time since Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced its formation during Sunday's cabinet meeting. Under the direction of Professor Manuel Trachtenberg, the 18 minister committee prepared to convene a roundtable discussion with the protest leaders in the coming days. This in a bid to establish concrete government measures to address social demands within one month's time. According to a cabinet source, after a meeting with Trachtenberg last night, the prime minister conceded that he must fundamentally change his positions with regard to Israeli economic policy. In addition, Netanyahu said he was prepared to change the tax policy that he had introduced some years ago. In the wake of the global economic pandemonium, the two also apparently agreed that government spending would not exceed the budget. Meanwhile, after weeks of ambiguity, the leaders of the tent protest compiled a document they call the Framework for Investment in a New Socioeconomic Agenda. The unprecedented position paper outlines principles for an alliance between the state and the public. The desired reforms include minimizing economic, racial, and gender-based inequalities, altering the economic system to allow budgeting and regulation of basic necessities, reducing housing prices, reaching fair salaries, providing incentives including government subsidies to social and geographical periphery, promoting care for the weakest populations, state investment in education, health and personal security, and offering real solutions in the fields of transportation, public infrastructure, and governmental intervention. Activists distributed their draft proposal to 10 cities throughout Israel for feedback. The inertia of the summer protest seems to be pushing the government to take action, but the question remains whether activists will be satisfied by the new measures. Ariel Reshef, IBA News. Efforts to persuade the Palestinians to return to direct peace talks with Israel and cancel their plans to pursue United Nations recognition of statehood are still underway. These words from Prime Minister Netanyahu to a group of international ambassadors to the United States who are currently on a week-long fact-finding mission to the country. The Prime Minister told the diplomats that Israel is prepared to make concessions, but the Palestinians are refusing to compromise by acknowledging Israel as the Jewish state, forfeiting the right of refugees, or agreeing that any future agreement will serve as a comprehensive resolution to the conflict between the two peoples. Netanyahu reminded the ambassadors that six Israeli prime ministers, including himself, have accepted the concept of a Palestinian state, but that all previous proposals, including far-reaching concessions, were summarily rejected by the Palestinians. In Ramallah, the Palestinian Authority has demonstratively raised the flags of the 122 nations that they claim have already recognized the Palestinian state ahead of the UN General Assembly vote coming up in September when the Palestinians will press for an official UN endorsement of statehood. Israel and the United States strongly oppose the unilateral move, saying that statehood should only be achieved through negotiations.
the White House today said the United States was giving $105 million in aid to alleviate hunger in Somalia. White House spokesman Jay Carney said the assistance would come from existing pools of money. The United States has earmarked $500 million for famine relief efforts in the Horn of Africa, a region which includes Somalia. Meanwhile, the United Nations Refugees Agency has flown aid into the war-torn capital of Somalia for the first time in five years as the country battles with a devastating famine. The flight left from Dubai this morning with 31 metric tons of emergency supplies and arrived in Mogadishu early this afternoon. There would be another two aid flights to Mogadishu, one on Thursday and another next week. Refugees fleeing hunger in Somalia continued arriving in Dadaab, the world's largest refugee complex in neighboring Kenya today. The United Nations High Commissioner for, for Refugees estimate about 1,300 to 1,500 refugees are arriving daily after crossing the border into the arid northeastern corner of Kenya, where a large-scale relief effort is underway. UN emergency coordinator said amidst today's new arrivals, the plan is to relocate 300 families daily. More than 12 million people in the Horn of Africa are in need of immediate food aid, including nearly half the Somali population. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible by grants from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation the Firedoll Foundation, and by support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news, read our blog, get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.